All right, so we'll, we'll start moving on. For myself, I'm a customer success manager here at Kativ Technologies. Um, a lot of you may recognize me. I did come from the Lifeline team over here, so I do have a lot of high technical background with various different products within the product design manufacturing collection and the AEC collection as well. Um, just keep a couple little highlights here. I did come from a mechanical design engineering uh, background inside of the oil and gas industry where I use very several or uh, various amount of tools from the PDMC collection, such as AutoCAD, PNID, Plan30, Inventor, and Vault. And then I, I left that industry and I went more into an AC MEP industry where I use a lot of Autodesk's AC tool sets, such as AutoCAD, Revit, Navisworks, and BIM360. So I really do have a, a quite a bit of knowledge with how all these tools kind of interact together and being able to be kind of leveraged into um, your environment. So for what we're planning on covering today is we're going to kind of go a little bit more in depth. And this is, I'm not sure if everyone kind of joined the first session by our, our, my colleague, Adam Evangelista, who hosted um, the first part of this tube and pipe, where he kind of dove into creating pipe styles, um, creating some pipe routes. This is really the next step from that segment. So we're going to go in a little bit further in depth with some of those workflows. Um, again, we're going to create a lot more authored components, um, getting the understanding of how you can leverage the authored components inside of your tube and pipe runs. Um, I'll, I'll definitely touch on being able to import standardized pipe styles between project to project as well. Um, so whether your company is leveraging a, a database of your pipe styles, um, keeping it as a standard, how you can then bring these into your, into your sub-assemblies uh, sub or even assemblies themselves. That way you have a, you know, a a um, you know a standard within your company itself um, the pipe tools and fitting placements we'll we'll talk about some of those some snap functions auto routes when to use them when not to use them getting the understanding of what auto routes could potentially affect your assembly as well and then additionally we'll talk about how you can then bring some of these assemblies into a drawing creation uh, if you need to create a specific detailed isometric drawing um, you could then extract the bill material so then you could submit that to your shop as well. Um, I'm seeing that we're getting some auto routes. I mean, am I, sorry, getting audio drops. Anyone getting audio drops at all? You sound fine on my end, Jeff. Okay. I got some, some chat saying that we have some auto, some audio drops or something. Okay, perfect. All right, so let's switch into, we'll go into Inventor. And we'll start with a couple different authoring, uh, touching on some of these authoring. Um, I have a, a compressor here, and this is just a part, maybe this is a, a manufactured component that you're getting. You're getting a detailed drawing, um, and you begin to fabricate this, that way you can then you know leverage this inside of your assembly. Um, the modeling is pretty much done now. What we're going to want to do so that we could begin leveraging and connecting our pipe runs to this is we're going to have to go in through the authoring function for this. Now for authoring, and this is as soon as you've you've done creating your part itself, we're going to go into the manage tab. And in the manage tab, there is this authoring palette here. If we expand right below where it says component, we have several different authoring tools. Um, so a little bit more specifically for the tube and pipe environment, there is its own tube and pipe authoring tool. So we'll click that one. And I'll kind of move this dialog just so we can see this. And I forgot to mention, we are doing this all in Inventor 2021. So if you're using an older version, um, some of the workflows uh, within routing is a little bit different. Um, you know, ask away in the chat, I'll do my best to kind of point out some of the differences between an older version from here, we're going to be able to define what type of connection we're going to have. And this is essentially how a pipe is going to get connected to some of these components you're creating. Um, so you have several different types. You have adapters down to flanges, uh, your crosses, different fittings that you may find within your content center. A little bit more specifically here, because this is a comp So I'm going to select flanges. Now, previously, um, you are able to author, I believe, before it was like up to 10 connections or even eight. Now you have the ability to author even beyond that now. So if I just keep clicking, I could author as many connections as I need to. So 
uh, you're not restricted really anymore. Um, before in the past, when I used to really leverage this tool on my previous company, I believe we only had eight connections that we could author at max. But now you don't have to really deal with that. Um, so you do have ability to kind of author multiple different connections with multiple end treatments as well. So I'll start off with this flange. I'm gonna select my end treatment and I could tell my end treatment at this being a flange. I can then tell it what type of size I want. This is my nominal size here. For my nominal size, I know that this is a four inch inlet for this compressor. I'll just go with four inch here. Where the next part it wants me to do is define the connection, where this is gonna start at. So I'm gonna start and select this raised face here. And you notice that it's automatically uh, determine the center point here. I can then specify the direction. I'm gonna just select that same raised face here. And you can see that there's a little purple segment here and this is how it's gonna be engaged. So I'm just gonna flip this axis. And you can see the arrows coming outward now. That's what I want right there. Now, if you did have a different entry in here, you could tell if, for instance, maybe you're dealing with a, a female connector, uh, some threaded connection. You could tell it if you want this to be a flange treatment or a, or a threaded treatment. And then you could tell it if it's gonna be male or female. In this case, I'm just gonna make this neutral. Now, additionally, I'll do one more connection. I'll just go with this back connection right here. So I'll select my connection number two. And I believe this back connection is a three inch. So I'll change this to three. And I'll go with the same type of process. I'm gonna select my center circle right there. And I'm gonna select that same point here. And then I'll flip my axis. Okay. And I'll click okay. Now, I, before I click okay, actually, if this, for instance, was maybe, a, maybe you're dealing with a lot of socket weld connections or even socket weld fittings, you do have the ability to kind of change how your components are being engaged. So if an example of this is, if this is a socket weld, a pipe would have to stick inside of here. And that pipe would then be seated inside of the socket, a value. And this value could be pertained to your shop's tolerances, uh, maybe a standardization that your company has. You can then tell it a certain engagement. You could go by a percentage here. So maybe you want your pipe to be engaged at this connection point to sit inside of it 50% of the time. Or you could set it a specific distance. So if you know that you're dealing with a three inch pipe size, you may have a rule within your company that, okay, if my engagement needs to be the diameter of the pipe divided by two to give you a value of 1.5. That's another example of being able to kind of specify your engagement and how these components are being interconnected and in this case, because I know this is flange, I don't need to adjust my engagement. So I'll just keep my, 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 nom my nominal engagement size at 0% here. And I'll keep these values like that. Now, let me add one more connection here. I'll add a third one here. I'll go with three. And you can see within this compressor, there is some threaded connections that are going to happen right here. So if I want to... Uh, bring in a maybe a swage lock fitting, for instance, maybe a male MPT connection by a tube. I'll be able to then bring the swage lock connection and connect it to one of these threaded fittings. And I'll do it right here. This one that's at a uh, odd angle. In this case, I'll change it to threaded for my end treatment. I could specify my size here and I'll say this could be, I'll say half inch. I don't know the exact size, but I'll go with half inch right here. I'll go with the same process and I'll try to select that inner circle right there. And then I'll select that same axis here. And I'm gonna flip the axis here. And I'm gonna tell that this is going to be a female connection. Now, if I know a specific distance, maybe, maybe you have a standard for how much threading is engaged within a connection, you can tell that that distance, I can go with a distance of say 0.125 eighth inch or even a quarter of an inch and set that engagement at a quarter. I'll click okay. Once you click okay, we've finished, we've told the inventor that we finished authoring this component. It's ready to be leveraged and used. 
And I'll show you an example of that momentarily, but I wanna go through another kind of example of authoring really quick. So let me just back out. Let me save this really quick. And I have a couple other authoring that I wanna go through. I'll switch to this valve here. I have a, this flow serve valve. You can see that it's a, a two-way valve. And this one, very, this one's a little bit easier. I just want to author these two flange connections. So that way I can bring these into my pipe assemblies. So in this case, if I just go into my manage again, go to my authoring for my tube and pipe, you can see that I previously already authored a tube connection here, an end treatment there. But I'm going to add two more here. I'll change my end treatment again to flanged. I could specify my, specify my size, which should be a three inch. And then my point being my outside circle. And let me just change around this just so we can see this a little bit better. And then my direction, that same outside circle. Okay. And I messed up. I did it to the first one. So I already, I changed that already. It's okay. I'll just switch to my second one again. It retained the entry made of flanged. I'll change my value here. Now I'm going to specify the other flange here. I'll select that same outside circle here, and then I'll flip my axis. So it's coming out this way. Okay. And then my third, I'll go back with the same one that I had here. Uh, this one, I believe I had it at other, just for this tube fitting right here. I'll select this outside circle here. And then I'm going to select that same outside circle and making sure that the arrow is coming outward. Now I could set this as female if I want to. And what female is doing, it's understanding that there's a standardization of a half inch threading and how much that half inch threading is being engaged with components. I'll just click OK. okay. And let me save that. So that author went through and I'll show you, I'll show you how we could use you shortly. I just want to go through one more authoring really quick. And another case, another instance of authoring is you may have assembly, an assembly like this. This is a sub assembly. This is just a little representation of a strainer. Now these strainers can be fabricated within your company's environment. Oftentimes, because this is its own sub assembly, this may have its own fabrication drawing. And you may not want to bring this entire assembly inside of your pipe run. My recommendation to kind of go about with your in-house custom fabrication, fabricated components or sub-assemblies like this is make a derived part of it. So that as this, this assembly's design is changing, going through different engineering cycles and phases, that derived part will update. And I'll show you how we could go, with, go about that. We'll make a new part really quick. I'll make a new standard part. From here, if I go inside of the Manage tab, what you're going to see is under this Insert portion, there's Derive. Now, under Derive, I'm just going to specify where that subassembly exists. And this could be any representation of any other component that you're making. And I'm going to find my strainer assembly. I'll click OK. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to have this retain associativity. And why I, want it, why I want that is because, as I was saying, if this assembly is changing, um, maybe you're changing design, changing sizing, it's going to maintain a link between it. So this derived part is going to be its own individual part once we insert it into our piping assembly. Okay, so I'm going to want this to maintain associativity. That's what this yellow... Um, little pluses right there, plus in the circle. So I'll click OK. And now you can see that it's a derived part. Now I could save this as its own unique part, and I'll save it within that same folder structure. And I'm just going to call this strainer. And now it's just a part that I could then bring into my pipe assembly. Where lastly, all I'm going to want to do here is then author it. Again, with authoring, I'll go into my flanges. I'll rotate around. I'll author my first flange here. 
my first flange should be a four inch. I'll select that outside circle for the raised face. I'll select that same outside circle. You can see my, my flow arrow is going the outside. My second point here, because I want to want pipe to run to this T here, I'm going to change this to butt weld now. So we'll find butt weld. I believe this is still four inch too. So I'll select this outside circle. And then I'll select that same access point. And I'll click OK. Click OK. So now it's just, it's just telling me that it's been published. It's ready to be used inside of your assembly. So now that we have an authored component here that's driven, being driven by the subassembly here. So as I change the design, if I add maybe a lifting lug, for instance, you'll see that lifting lug be generated inside of your drive component. Okay. Now, lastly, is you may have a case where you're downloading components. And this one's a, a male MPT connection directly from SwageLock. A lot of your vendors may be providing 3D, um, 3D data files that you could bring directly into an inventor. From here, once you download it, you can then open it in Inventor using the AnyCAD function, which I did here. You could save the component. And then lastly, just go through a phase of authoring it. So I'll just go back into managing it. My manage app, go into my author, my tube and pipe. I'll switch this around really quick. And because this is a connector, I'll change this to being a connector type. I have two connection points, so this is going to be threaded. And I know that this is a three quarter inch MPT, so I'll put that value as three quarter inch. I'll specify my start point, my end axis point here, and I'll flip my direction here. I'll tell it that this is a male connection here. And then for my second connection here, I'll change this and trim it to other, just cause, because a tubing is gonna go right here. I'll switch sides really quick. I'll specify my outside, my axis, and then it's going to still have that same three quarter inch value because it is tubing. But in this case, I'll keep it female. The tubing is going to sit inside there a little bit. And it's going to sit inside there by a value of 50%. This is the engagement. And I'll click OK. All right, so we've authored several different components now. Now let's see how we can use these inside of your assemblies now. So I'll switch into the skid package assembly that I have here. Yeah. Now I do have some updates and that's because some of these components in here I've authored already. So I'll just update that really quick and I'll save it. Now we'll go with this first one here and we'll go with the strainer assembly that I created here. I'll go into my tube and pipe runs. So let me find, let me minimize these a little bit. Got some things open. I'll go into my tube and pipe runs. And I'm going to activate this assembly here. So let's, let's find this assembly here, this run five I have. Now we'll go with this derived component first. So we'll place that. We'll see what that, what that treatment's like. I'm going to place that fitting. Because it is a custom component that I created, I'm placing it from my folder location. So I'm just going to find my strainer assembly, and there's my strainer part. From here, I could then right click and connect the fitting and connect it directly to this entry in here. And then you could go through the process of rotating this. In this case, I know that my outlet's going to go directly into this compressor. So I'm fine with that. And then I could escape. But what's great about this now is now you have a single item inside of this potential isometric bill material for that derived part. I can then go in here and if I want, because it is just a a strainer assembly, I could go through and give it a, its own unique description. Or you could reference that description to its assembly fabrication drawing. But in this case, I'm just going to continue going to the route and continue routing now. And because I, because I went through the authoring portion of this T here, I could now select that T to my compressor and generate the route. Now, in this case, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to convert my auto route to a sketch. Okay, it's just a straight segment here. Now that's something that's new in 2021 is being able to convert your auto routes right away into a sketch. 
Now, if I go and change my display to routes only here, I can see what you probably would be seeing inside of an older version of Inventor. You're just line work here before you populate the route. So there's a driven dimension here. This is not really needed. So I could just delete this. And you can see what's driving this is I do have a flange locator here. Um, so a couple of different ways how you can kind of drive these assemblies. I myself am more of a fan of creating these flange locators that are just a surface part that I generated. And then I use those to locate my piping assemblies or my pipe runs. Instead of bringing in a, a flange and having those kind of outside of your assembly environment. All right, I'll finish that sketch and I'll display my objects again. Now let's look here now, let's go with that flow serve valve now. Now with the flow serve valve, which is this three inch one here, I authored the endpoints here. Now let's go about with this one, let's insert it inside of a run. So I'll finish this tube and pipe run right here and I'm gonna find this assembly here. Okay, so we could go and find that pipe run. Uh, it's right here. Expand that. And just like we did with the derived strainer there, I'm going to go place fitting and find where that find where I saved that three inch flow serve valve. And here it is. This is pretty big. It's a three inch, 150 pound. So I'm going to insert it now. I want this to be inserted between my flange locator here and this gasket. So I'm going to insert it in this case. I'm going to insert it directly there. And from here, I can then rotate it and have it placed in that direction. Okay. So now I have my, my flow serve valve. It's a three inch valve. I have it connected to my flange locator and then I can continue and populate a route. Now in this case right here, if I want this, maybe where I'm routing from this reducer, maybe to route into this, this T that we have here. You see this, or not this T, this uh, 45 degree elbow right here. A couple of different ways you could go about this. We can go into the route itself and I could route directly from this reducer here. And then maybe I need, maybe I there's another object that's maybe around this area here, or maybe I'm gonna account for some additional pipe supports that are gonna be needed for this piping assembly here. I can then just simply come out a value. I could come up a value here and I'll just kind of pretend I'm jogging around a component that may be underneath this, this one particular ISO. Now in cases like this, you may wanna just simply try to connect by snapping to this endpoint here, right? So this may, you know, this may generate a route that may be useful here, but it's not, it may, it may not give you the kind of end result you're looking for. What I really like to do in cases like this is I like to use point snaps. So from this endpoint here, we know that I need to come out a value. If I know that this is gonna be my connection point here, I know that this connection point here may be within that same ISO. So what I'm gonna do is locate where I have that 45 degree elbow. Okay, so I wanna find that 45 degree elbow within this run. And I'm gonna use the, the elbow's origin so that I can snap to these locations. So I'm expanding this elbow, I'm expanding the use and visibility of these origins here so that when I go back into the run itself, go to this endpoint here, I can then right click and make sure I'm in, activated with my point snap here. And then I can point snap directly to an elbows plane. In this case, it's gonna be this X, Y plane here. It's gonna take me to the exact distance from that endpoint there to this elbows endpoint here. See how far it went out? Now, in 2021, additionally, I could have made that line become parallel right away. I'm a fan of having your lines become fully constrained. So let me do that again. Let me delete this. And let me let me run that same point snap again so you can see what the difference of what this looks like now. I'll select that same endpoint here. And in this case, I know I want this line to go back to that same Z direction. So I'm gonna turn on my Z parallel here. 
And I'll do that same point snap now. Now, the only difference here is it didn't constrain it parallel, and that's because I didn't make this vertical be parallel to the Y. In cases like this, what you can do is include geometry. And I'm going to just scroll up, and I'm going to include my origin axis here. I'm going to include my X, my Y, and my Z. And I'm doing this is because I can then create a parallel constraint along this vertical line here to there. So now I'll escape out of there. And then we have a couple questions come in. How do you create a flange locator? That may be something I could show afterwards. I don't think I'll be able to show it here. Now, in this case here, if let me finish this route really quick. Let me just back out of this. What I'll do in this route now is I can then just by my objects really quick, just so I can see what my route's looking like. And I'm going to go back into a part priority really quick, and I'm going to place another elbow right at the end of this, just so you could kind of see what this will do. Okay. Now, by adding an elbow, I, I did do a point snap directly to this endpoint here. I want to show you something a little bit different here. This, this additional elbow obviously increased my length, so I'm going to have to shorten this pipe run by that length of the elbow. I believe it's just three inches, a two inch elbow. Or I could do a measurement really quick just to see. Expand my origin here and I'll just measure just to confirm from this axis to here, just to see what that is. Yep, it is three inches. And I could go back into my route really quick. And, and it is because I did do a, a point snap. I'll just go to this value and subtract it by three. Okay, so now these are back aligned. I'll just finish that. You can see the elbow adjusted. Now from here, if I go back into the route itself, I can go from this 45 degree elbow, and let me move this little dialog right here, go from the end point there. And then another example of point snapping here is maybe I want this to 45 up and then come straight into this T. Now, now, I could probably go get that same output just by going here, but let me show you an example of that. Let me find this elbow here first. And I believe it's, which one is it? This elbow right here. So yeah, let me make sure I have that elbow selected. Go from the end point here. I'll make sure my point snaps on. So I'm just gonna right click. Now I'm just gonna find that origin plane that I want. And it should be this XZ. So it's gonna come up that exact value there. I wanna make this go parallel with my X now. So I'm just gonna bring this degree down here and you can see that the axis went parallel with the X now. And now I'll click into this endpoint there and click my green dot to confirm it. Now, because I did specify this exact angle here by a point snap or this exact length here, I did generate an auto route here. Now auto routes are great. Um, they, you know, they're very helpful for creating them, but really understanding what auto routes could do and potentially affect this. If I go to this auto route and convert this to a sketch, for instance, you'll see that it has an angular dimensional value here, which is 135 degrees, this is driven, and then a driven length dimension here from that, that 45 degree endpoint to where I connected it to this 90 degree elbow. If I were to maybe change the location of this heat exchanger, your auto routes may break. You may see that they start to break your routes itself. So I would typically recommend kind of converting your auto routes to sketches and then removing dimensional values. Let me change this display to routes only really quick. And then removing dimensions so that you could allow yourself to have a more of a uh, dynamic route. If I delete this, if I delete this and this here, what I can now do is make this parallel here. I'll make this, let's see if I have this parallel there. There we go. And what this is allowing me to do, it's gonna maintain this degree here. 
But if I were to pull this heat exchanger back now, let me see if I could find this heat exchanger really quick and let me get out it. Let me get, get outside of my pipe runs really quick and display this. I'm gonna go back to the top really quick and I'll just collapse all just so we can see all this. I'm gonna find this heat exchanger here. Now I do know that this, for instance, this route right here is an auto route and same with this route here from this flange locator going into my heat exchanger. If I were to re relocate this equipment here, let me just find it in browser. If I were to relocate it, change this dimensional value. So I have a minus 36 for its location. Let's see what it does if I go to minus 48. You can, you can see that this auto route's trying to <laughs> see what happened with this auto route here, All right? All I did was change this value and made this come out further. But this auto route that I kept intact here completely broke. It gave me a weird different route, something that's not, not something that my shop will never want to fabricate. I created all these pockets for no reason. See that? Just by changing that one dimensional value for my equipment. Or now if I go back, let me undo this really quick. If I go back into this auto route and let me find it within this, the pipe run itself, let's see what the behavior is now if I convert it to a sketch. Okay. And let me go find this route. Let me go into the tube route itself or the route 08 here. You can see I have two auto routes. I have an auto route two and then an auto route one. So what I'll do in this case is, yeah, the, the route looks great, but just to further configure this, I'm gonna convert it to a sketch. And same thing with the second one here. I'll convert it to sketch. And let me just change my display really quick so we see the line work only. So we have something like this now. Now you can tell, to tell this is just a simple, pretty much a simple route. I'm going to delete these dimensions. I don't need these. I'll keep this, these driven ones. Don't even need. I thought one of these were, was a, an actual value there. In this case, I'll just give myself a perpendicular constraint here. And the perpendicular is not needed there. Let's see if I can use perpendicular here. Nope. Or lastly, I'll just do a parallel. So I'm going to include my geometry one more time. I'll include my X, my Y. M I Z, and then I'll do a parallel from this line here, the X, to the X of the assembly. Let's go with this one here, parallel here. Oh, I think it just the dimensions actually needed. Let's see. Probably just the dimensional values needed here. Let's see what's going to drive that. Probably this dimension here. Yep, 25.5. So I'll just add this one dimension just to drive this. So it's gonna maintain this 25.5 coming out from this flange here. And let me just do that really quick to this bottom one. I think this is driven as well. So let me just go back to this bottom route as well. A route of seven. Go into the route seven really quick. Let me convert my auto route to a sketch as well. I'll delete these driven dimensions. I don't need these. And let me make this routes only. Yep, so this looks good. Okay, so this has a 4.5 there. It's probably fine. Let's see if I could keep this here. So I just put a perpendicular there. So now I have this route being driven just by this, this 25.5 on both of these. Okay. Now let's finish this route here. Let me display all objects really quick. Now let's take a look at the behavior now. Display all these objects. Now, if I go back into my heat exchanger, let's move this heat, heat exchanger now. So let's find that heat exchanger again. I'll move this value. What did I do? Did I, get, did I say 48? I can't remember what. We'll go with 42. You can see now these runs themselves now are maintaining the actual the actual route preference I wanted. See that as I'm changing that equipment, same thing here. 
And that's because I try to make these as dynamic as possible so that they could automatically update. Let me change that value. I think I went 48. I think I pushed it a little bit further. Let's try to push this even further. The line is 48. Let this update. And it's gonna break here. And that's because there's not enough straight length right here to meet that endpoint. But you can see now where this was auto routed, it's not coming up with some, some crazy snake anymore, right? It's maintaining this actual route design that I wanted so that I could easily adjust this equipment. Maybe I need to fit some valves in here, or maybe I need to fit another little pump assembly within this area there now. Now I can then move my equipment and have my routes automatically update with it. So that's a little example of how you can kind of configure these, these routes themselves. So let me, let me change this value back. I think I went back to 136. And you can see now this fix itself. Now we do have a couple of questions coming in. Let's see what these are. If the dimensions are driven, do we still need to be deleted? Uh, they don't need to be deleted, Claudio. I just personally like to clean them up myself. Hi, GDMMG. GDMG is only possible in 2021 or I believe that's only possible in 2021, Samuel. I believe that's only possible in 2021. Now, one more thing is I believe on this compressor, right? I believe I, I believe I, um, I authored a tube fitting in there. So let's, let's see how the tube fitting interacts with my authored tube that I downloaded from Swagelock. So let's go back to my skid package here. I believe I already started a, a run already. So let me just dive into this run really quick. Just for time purposes too, Jeff, just FYI, keep an eye on the time. Yep, let me just place this last one and then we'll call it after. Okay. So for from here, I'll just go back into place fitting and I'll find that tube fitting. And we'll go with this one right here. Now I could just connect it. I could find where I connected it, which was this angle there. And you can see now it's retained that connection. And then from there, I can then route my tube runs within my route itself. I can create a new route. Click OK, and then make a tube run. So if I have a half inch, I do have a half inch style there. And then create my tube run off those fittings. OK, so I know we're running out of time here. Uh, I won't probably, won't probably fully create this, but hopefully everyone got the idea of how we can start leveraging those. Um, I know it was pretty quick, but I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover really quick. Um, oh, one more thing. I forgot to kind of cover point snaps or a rotation snap really quick. Let me just show that really quick. And I'll do it within this run itself. You can kind of see how this works. I'll go into this route. Now, maybe this route right here, uh, let me show my routes only. I'll delete this here. Maybe I've maybe I've really specified this route length here, but this route itself may need to connect into maybe this bottom connection of the heat exchanger instead of where I was originally tying into this 45 degree elbow. What I can do is I can edit this, I can select that the elbow right here. I can right click on the elbow, edit fitting orientation, and then I could then just by making sure and selecting one of these rotational arrows here, and I'm gonna make sure my rotation snaps turn on just by right clicking. I can then uh, select this arrow, hold it, and then select where I wanna to connect to. You can see now that elbows directly rotated to where I could, to that endpoint here. And then I can route directly off that elbow into that heat exchanger connection if I need to. I don't have to do any calculations to determine that angle that I need to, to give me a direct run or route into that component now. Where rotation snap just configured that for me. Okay. So that's pretty much it, all I have for today. Um, we'll go back into here. Um, I did wanna kind of talk about some of the learning resources. Again, we do have our, our Kativ AVAs. Uh, so. Just make sure you take a look at some of those videos. If you didn't catch the previous one hosted by Adam, the part one of this tube and pipe, I would definitely recommend taking a look at that. Adam dove into further of creating custom 
um, tube and pipe run styles in there and how you can leverage those inside of your, your company's environment. Okay. So some questions and answers, Q and A. See if we have anything. I know we got a pretty busy chat going on here, huh? Yeah, we can we can jump through the chats. Um, I guess you answered one of the questions is like, where's the part one? So the part one's on our YouTube channel. If you just search Katif Technologies on YouTube, you'll find it. Yeah. And all of the last five years of APAs are all there. So that's uh, that's one place to take a look if you haven't already. We are definitely missing some tube and pipe in there. So that's what we're really trying to add. I know it's an environment that a lot of our customers are using. We just want to make sure that we're providing as much resources on that as possible. Yep. I mean, if there's anything else inside of the environment that you want us to further take a look at, I know someone asked about how we create those flange locators. A quick, just quick high level on that. I just created a, a 3D part. I made it a surface part just so that it has no weight so that it doesn't affect my assembly environment. Um, so if you do need to you know, populate your center of gravity at all from your assembly, it's, it won't have any effect at all. But then I authored that component as a flange locator at the front of it. So that then when I'm creating my routes, I can directly connect to those after I locate them inside of my assembly. All right, there's a YouTube question as well. Um, Jeff, can you tell us the name of the vendor for the mail connector? Okay, that yep, that is Swage Lock. They're just a, a standard tubing um, fabricator that makes Swage Lock fittings. Um, so they have various different connectors. They have all their parts and models that you can download. So if you need a particular connector or a particular tubing connection, you can find it on one of their catalogs and download it. Very similar to McMaster Car. You can probably check McMaster Car to see if they have anything on there as well. But Swage Lock is primarily where I go to for tube fittings. Cool. Um, do you see any others that you haven't gone through, Jeff? I know that you answered a ton of uh, these as you were actually going through the webinar. Yeah, sorry about that. I think I got, John, see if you're not authoring a may not be two by tube adapter, do you need to attach your connecting point to the inside surface of the two piece fully engage it? No, John, you don't need a uh you don't need to author to the inside piece. You could do the outside and then determine your your tube engagement value by a, a specified distance or uh inventor will do its best guess to understand based on the size a mathematical equation to understand engagement for that tube fitting i came from you know very being very specific um, my shop had a lot of tolerances for fabrication so i put those tolerances inside my authoring itself all right i think that's everything jeff yeah, but that's it. I had, that's everything I had. Um, thank you, everyone. Yep, no worries. Uh, thanks again, Jeff. And it looks like Bill just mentioned something saying that you mentioned something about something you can use to start runs arrow. Oh, that's the flow, uh, the flow, uh, the flow locators, the flange locators I, I had in my, my assembly. That again is just a, a 3D arrow kind of part that I created. Um, that's a surface part. And then I author that part as a flange connection so that when I bring those into my assembly, I can then manually constrain them where I want my connection or my tie-in points to be. And then I can create my routes off of it. Yep. And uh, cheers to you, Bill. I know that uh, Bill's one of our good friends here at Kativ. Bill helped put together a ton of the tutorial information too in Inventor. So if you have used Inventor tutorials, uh, which I have extensively to learn a lot of this stuff, um, you can partially thank that man right there. So um, thanks again, Bill. I may even just do that as my tech tip. So I know a lot of people are asking questions about the flow locator. I'll do that as my tech tip. <laughs> so just take, take a look at that within our, uh, I believe we do that on LinkedIn and some, some other locations too. So I'll make sure I, I highlight that so everyone gets an understanding of how you could create a flow locator or a flange locator. Yep, absolutely. Um, all right, that seems like that's everything. Jeff, again, thanks for putting this together for us. I know that We've had a, uh, a visible lack of tube and pipe information on our channel as well as our website for the last couple of years. And it looks like we're, you know, we're knocking that out of the park. So definitely appreciate you being here for it. Thank you. Appreciate everyone's feedback and uh, participation. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you again next week. Uh, we got a couple of AVAs coming up over the next couple of weeks before the uh, the Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays. So definitely stay tuned. We're not going anywhere. Talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.